He was the world's most wanted man, and now he's dead. The leader of Daesh blew himself up after U.S. forces stormed his safe house in northwestern Syria. It's a blow to the group, but does it mean their threat of terror is over for good? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He declared himself the leader of an Islamic state. And soon, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and his brutal terror group controlled territory the size of Great Britain. For years, Daesh ruled large parts of Iraq and Syria, murdering and torturing any who opposed them. But soon, the militants began to lose control. Now they've lost their leader, too, killed in Idlib, just a few kilometers from the Turkish border, in a raid by U.S. forces. But the Americans couldn't do it alone. Following the operation, the U.S. president thanked Turkey, Russia, Syria and Iraq for their cooperation. Trump might have got Baghdadi, but nobody so far has been able to attain peace. And as Haider Abbasi explains, the war in Syria is far from over. These are the remains of the home belonging to the most wanted man in the world. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was targeted in a raid by U.S. special forces in Syria. The self-described caliph and leader of Daesh had nowhere to run. According to the White House, Baghdadi went down a dead-end tunnel connected to the house. He ignited his vest, killing himself and the three children. His body was mutilated by the blast. The tunnel had caved in on it in addition. But test results gave certain immediate and totally positive identification. It was him. The leader of what was once the most feared terror group in the world is dead. President Donald Trump says no U.S. personnel were killed or wounded during the operation. But according to Trump, two of Baghdadi's wives were found dead and 11 children were detained. The president says U.S. intelligence agencies had been watching Baghdadi for two weeks before the raid. The Daesh leader was killed near the remote village of Berisha in Syria's northwestern province of Idlib, about five kilometers south of Turkey's border. The location is important because Idlib is controlled by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, fighters opposed to Syria's Bashar al-Assad. They're also fierce rivals of Daesh. Baghdadi declared his so-called caliphate in 2014 after his men captured the Iraqi city of Mosul. From there, the terror group quickly expanded. By 2015, Daesh controlled vast areas of Iraq and Syria, around 88,000 square kilometers. It ruled over a million people. But after an operation was launched by an international coalition to defeat the terror group, its territory was reduced to a pocket of land in eastern Syria. In March, its so-called caliphate was wiped out. Daesh became infamous for its brutality, beheading prisoners of war, burning captives alive, enslaving minority communities and inspiring terror attacks across the world. The death of Baghdadi ends one chapter in the war in Syria, but another has already begun. These are Assad soldiers arriving in Ain al-Arab. They haven't been seen here since they lost control of the northern city in 2012. The YPG terror group had held it, but it turned to the Syrian regime in desperation after Turkey moved into its territory. In just a few days, Turkey's army forced out the terror group from towns and villages. Ankara says the YPG is a threat to its national security and wants to create a safe zone along its border with Syria. But a pause in the fighting was agreed, and Turkey negotiated a deal with Syria's powerful ally, Russia. Russia and Turkey will now patrol border towns in northern Syria. The return of the regime in northern Syria has been made easier by the U.S. decision to withdraw its troops from the region. Since 2017, American soldiers had patrolled Manbij and other areas. But that void has now been filled by Russia. Will this now help Moscow to extend its influence over Syria and Turkey? 
And what could this mean for relations between Turkey and its NATO allies? Heyda Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now in Ankara is Murat Aslan. He led the intelligence division of the Turkish Armed Forces and is now a security researcher at the SETA Foundation. Sergei Markov is in Moscow. He's a former Russian MP and was a spokesman for President Vladimir Putin. In New York is lawyer Dave Jonas. He worked on nuclear non-proliferation for the Pentagon under the Bush administration. And Donald Trump nominated him to be the Energy Department's legal counsel. And with me on set is Yasser Tabara. He's a senior fellow at the Omran Center for Strategic Studies and a former spokesman for the opposition Syrian interim government. Gentlemen, good to have you all on the program. And let me just say from the outset, my apologies in advance if I have to interrupt, time is our enemy. Yasser Tabara, how do you feel as a Syrian? Baghdadi's dead. Any relief, any consolation? Well, there's no question about it. Good riddance. Um, let's be very, very clear. This is a man who brought much destruction to Syria, directly or indirectly, mostly indirectly. And I say that because we have to keep things in a larger context, which is uh, with all of the criminality and uh, the, the rotten ideology that al-Baghdadi and ISIS brought uh, to this world, uh, they are still responsible for less than, directly responsible for less than two or three percent of the, amount, of the number of victims in Syria. Mm. The Assad regime being the, the main culprit behind more than 90% of the death and destruction of Syrians and, and Syrian lives and, and Syrian infrastructure and Syrian cities. And so for us, uh, we've always seen uh, that uh, ISIS and Baghdadi and, and other uh, types of groups uh, have always been used as a um, uh, sort of a, a way to, uh, to, to get in and, and to sort mm -hmm. of interfere in what's happening in Syria, taking advantage of this, uh, you know, security vacuum. At certain points, uh, Syrian fighters that belonged to a, a more organized Free Syria army uh, back, I would say, 2011, 2012, even into 2013. Uh, and let me remind all the, the viewers that, that these were the factions that were most effective in terms mm -hmm. of isolating ISIS and fighting ISIS until basically they got the rug pulled uh, from underneath and Everybody them. got painted with the extremist brush. Exactly. Right. And so um, where things are going from, from now, we're not very uh, optimistic, right. but obviously the death of someone like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi <laughs> is, is very right. much welcomed by much, many Syrians, I would say, if not all. Sergei Markov, can you accept that? Baghdadi was terrible. He was the, a terrorist leader of a horrible group that killed, mutilated, raped, did horrendous atrocities. But he was just a... Oh, I'll... You put that on silent, right? Okay, so he's a terrible leader of a terrible terror group. They killed, they raped, they did all these things, but that was, they were merely a symptom or a manifestation of a war. And the real evil is still Assad. Can you accept that? <laughs> yeah, I'm... I'm uh, surprised. Interesting. When you and uh, General Turkish TV will uh, change uh, rhetoric from Assad regime to the uh, Syrian government, I was talking according to my um, uh, prediction, it will happen uh, in the middle of uh, 2020. Okay, so that um, style guide and... semantics. We'll look forward to whatever happens there. But can you answer the question, please, yeah. sir? Yeah, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Baghdadi uh, death uh, not so significant for the security situation in Syria. It's significant for the uh, Donald Trump very much, uh, because he now accusing United States for the betrayal of Kurds and uh, for uh, giving mm -hmm. up uh, the the position, United American position in Syria, and the Russia uh, taking control of the American role in uh, Syria. Okay. So for uh, Donald Trump, it was very important to give some response. So, and uh, he, I think, asked uh, to uh, kill uh, uh, al-Baghdadi, kill his security. Right. Uh, but also everybody uh, knows that uh, Daesh, uh, is more a uh, network organization, but not so much a uh, centralized uh, army. Right. And Daesh m have been destroyed on 90% by, first of all, by uh, Russia, uh, Russian aviation and Syrian army. And I should remember you that before Russia starting real war against uh, Daesh, Daesh growing, growing, growing. And only after Russia had been involved, uh, that is growing down. Okay, so let me and ask Murat Aslan American... if that's true. Okay, so let me ask Murat Aslan if that's true. Murat Aslan, the Russians were the game changers, and that perhaps 
Daesh wouldn't have been all but defeated, at least in its territory, and now their leader wouldn't be dead if it wasn't for the Russians defeating them mostly along the way. Is that accurate? Uh, actually, Russia is a fact in Syrian theater because after Russia intervened to Syrian ground, we know that all dynamics had changed and still is changing. But on the other hand, uh, there is another reality. Daesh has grown up without any, uh, you know, interference of Russia or the United States or Syria, but the dynamics that that was a reality in Iraq and Syria. And enjoyed a grant in two different countries and enjoyed the popular support. That's, that's reality. On the other hand, we know that there was, there was an overall uh, suppression of Daesh in Syria and in Iraq. Right. And it's a result of overall efforts of all countries. Turkey did so, and Russia may did so, Right. But we have, to, we have to care not only Daesh, but the root causes and also probable <clears throat> outcomes after right. uh, yesterday's incident. Baghdad is, uh, you know, killed. Right. Let me bring in Dave Jonas. Dave Jonas, undoubtedly seen as a win for President Donald Trump. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi killed, perhaps not of the same symbolism as somebody like um, bin Laden right, who attacked America on home soil, killed 3,000 people and so on, but still seen as a victory. Is it seen as a bookend for the United States to get out of Syria now? To some extent, I think so. I think that's a very good point. I, I, I like your bookend analogy. And I think that, that one, one thing people don't talk about very much in this, in this regard is that it's also a victory for the concept of Westphalian sovereignty. In other words, no one is thrilled to have Assad in charge of Syria and seemingly safe for now. But yet that is better than this idea of a stateless terrorist entity controlling land and acting like a state when they're not a sovereign entity. So I think it's, it's a victory on any number of levels. And the other important thing here is that I think that the world is going to see very clearly the difference between what happens when the U.S. goes into an area and rebuilds roads and hospitals and takes care of people versus when the Russians go in, and it will be very interesting to see how much money they spend on the population and rebuilding. Okay, and we'll get a response from Sergei Markov in, in a moment, but I want to ask you, Yasser, when you hear that from Dave Jonas, he's talking about real politic here. A lot of these nations have thought, okay, well, Assad might have done a lot of terrible things, but he doesn't want to attack us in our home countries. He's not exporting an ideology. He's not blowing up people in subways and on <clears> streets of Western capitals or Istanbul even or, or elsewhere. Therefore, he's a less bad choice and we'll deal with him maybe later, but we need to stop imminent terror threats. How do you feel about that? I mean, I don't know when the sort of the Western order is going to come to terms with the, uh, you know, realities of this realpolitik that is very engaged in this very immediate, very short-term, non-strategic type of, type of view. I mean, look, what, look at what's happening in Lebanon right now. Look what is happening in Iraq. Look at what's ha been happening in terms of the, you know, the, the, the waves of protest throughout mm -hmm. the Arab world. This is an indication that the security situation, the political situation, and, and based on it, the security situation in the Middle East and North African region is just not sustainable. When you have a, uh, a regime uh, such as the, the regime of Bashar al-Assad, someone who is uh, a, a mass criminal um, and someone who has deeply destabilized the region prior to 2011, prior to the, to, 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 to the waves of, 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 of these revolutions. I mean, look at his behavior and the re behavior of his regime uh, throughout uh, the, the first decades of the, of the mm -hmm. 2000s um, after the American invasion in Iraq. What, how did he react uh, to it? Uh, what, you know, the, the types of, uh, uh, you know, the, direct and indirect support that he, he's done to terrorist groups to destabilize uh, societies and destabilize certain things. And so we have to go back to the root causes. We cannot ignore right. that anymore. Okay, so Dave Jonas, is this then a problem merely deferred to a later date rather than a problem solved? That's a great question also. Obviously, the Middle East is full of problems and and 
there's been a lot of accusations about President Trump abandoning the Kurds, and that's particularly a troublesome allegation, but it's also false. I think there is a, a, a I'd like to paraphrase, you know, Lord Palmerston, I think, who said nations don't have friends, they have interests. And at some point, you know, America has to focus on its own problems. We've been in the Middle East for years. Our, our military is getting worn out and it's time to move on. The Kurds understand this. The Kurds didn't fight with us because they think we're so great. They fought with us because it, it was aligned with their interests at the time. They understand that our interests have changed and it's time for us to move out. They're big boys, they can take care of themselves. They should have their own state. The Treaty of Sieve, Sieve uh, in 1920 gave them essentially a state, but Turkey abrogated that treaty and they don't have a state. I do hope there's a way that they get, get a state in the future at some point. Murat Aslan, is Turkey interested anymore in bringing broader peace and stability to Syria? If it gets its safe zone, is it satisfied? Does it, does it not care anymore or as much as it used to in the past about um, a future democratic Syrian state and so on? Because a lot of people are seeing everybody's competing interests are just getting what they can for themselves. No more, no less. That's where we're at in this war. I think what you have done is a clear proof of what you will do. And Syria and Kyiv is a significant one that you can easily observe the actor's behavior in the way to either to build a stable and secure Syria or to divide it in tiers. What Turkey did until now is to establish a secure zone, to secure the borders, to eradicate the terror threat over there, and also facilitate uh, immigrants to go back. And after the military interventions, for instance, Aziz and al Turkey encouraged local administrations to improve themselves in a sustainable manner. And now Turkey is at the lowest profile, but the local councils. On the other hand, latest agreements between Turkey and Russia and the United States clearly limits Turkey, Turkey's ability to build or occupy a land, but establish a status quo. I see. And what Turkey expects is to facilitate a political process in Genoa. That means there is a kind of chain that is linked, uh, you know, each other. Right. And this chain will go to democracy if all parties agree. Okay. That's... That's what Turkey expects in the region. Okay, and in, in a few moments, I'm going to ask Yasser Tabara how much faith he has in that process. Uh, Dave Jonas, this is where we thank you. We're going to mix it up a little bit now. We uh, thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers once again. Always a pleasure, sir. Let's bring in Peter Eltsoff in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's an international affairs professor at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. So, Peter, Turkey gets a safe zone. The Americans get their win in killing the ISIS leader, and Russia gets the whole Middle East. Is that what's happening? Well, I would make a conclusion that it gets the whole Middle East. And then I would also say it's not Russia, it's Putin. Uh, because Russia today is all about Putin, and when he goes, the situation may change. I would even argue that Russia had never had a political system which was uh, even not under Stalin, which is so much dependent on uh, one man. But yes, for the time being, uh, Russia has become a very uh, powerful uh, player in the Middle East. There is no question, and particularly the last visit to Saudi Arabia mm. and Abu Dhabi showed that Putin's visit. So, I mean, uh, for the time being, it's going to play a very significant role there. Sergei Markov, Russia is the main player, especially with regards to Syria right now? Is that how you see it? Uh, and usually in the normal country, uh, foreign policy, usually responsibility is uh, the leader of the uh, state, president or prime minister. And uh, Russia is normal country. And we have no uh, parliament who is blocking uh, foreign policy of the president, as we can see in the United States, where mm -hmm. chaos as a result, come to power. And also, it's very important, Russian President Vladimir Putin fully control Russian military and security intelligence service community. It's also, uh, from uh, our point of view, much more better than 
what we could see in the uh, United States and partly in Great Britain, where uh, internet security uh, community uh, now get out of control of the political institution in doing what they are doing. Uh, we know that they cooperated with so-called white helms and white helms cooperated with terrorists in Syria and also United States security uh, community support uh, and organize the coup in, UN in Ukraine, they overthrown democratically elected president, and they base this on the uh, neo-Nazi groups, okay. which so, is now uh, okay, let me ask part Peter, of the power okay. in the Ukraine uh, Peter, illegal government. Peter Elsoff, what we've heard from Sergei Markov is sort of par for the course, as they say. I've heard this characterization of the situation very often, besides the issues of you know, Congress ha hampering presidents and so on in the U United States and elsewhere. This idea of Russia's place in the Middle East and how it is far superior than what the Americans are doing elsewhere. Tell me if that is representative of a changing Russian foreign policy or just an extension of Putin. Well, there are several comments I would like to make, to particular what Mr. Markov said. I mean, first of all, the Congress is not blocking the decisions. We have a separation of power. And what he was talking, I don't know what he meant by a normal country, a normal country where one man runs the show, basically a deeply authoritarian state. And what Russia calls a deep state in the United States is in reality the tradition of a separation of powers and independence of those separate branches of power. I mean, the United States for the time being, yes, is withdrawing from Syria. And I think it didn't start with uh, Donald Trump has started with Obama when he drew the red line and then uh, basically gave away to Putin. But again, I would emphasize it may be a very temporary situation. But if uh, a foreign policy depends on one man right. in Russia and, right. and, uh, and the whole power, the pyramid of power, we may see tremendous changes after Putin go. We may see something, witness something what happened after the death of Stalin. So we don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen to Russia. For the time being in Syria, yes, uh, and for America, it's probably, as the previous speaker actually was talking, um, that, um, I mean, it makes sense probably at this point to withdraw from Syria. And right. uh, the Kurds can take care of themselves. Uh, right, right. Uh, it's unfair. It might be unfair to Kurds, of course, uh, and it's perceived by many in the United States that President Trump betrayed his allies. Right. Let's bring in Yasser Tabara again. So Yasser Tabara, there's a lot of hope in, in a process, right? We heard from Murat Aslan as well, this hope of a process that might have started in Astana and then there's a, a chat in Sochi and now there's hopes that um, this can breathe new life into a new Geneva process. President Erdogan, Vladimir Putin getting together, uh, deciding what's best for their own interests but also looking for what's best for the country of Syria and the Syrian people. Do you have any trust in that process? Um, I mean, there's a lot of that process to be seen, obviously. Um, I mean, going back to sort of the geopolitical picture and sort of going back to what you're saying in terms of everyone acting on behalf of their, their own interest. I mean, it just makes sense that sometimes interests are aligned and with the Syrian people and sometimes they're not. And, um, and, and here I would say, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, political ambitions or the, um, you know, political interest of, of, of these countries uh, are not necessarily aligned mm -hmm. sometimes with, 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 with us as Syrian people. I mean, uh, it seems like actually all geopolitical actors are not working towards a strategy. They're working towards immediate, right. immediate gains but for perhaps laughably Iran, actually. I mean, Iran right. is, 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 is the country that is uh, looking at this from a, a long-term perspective. Yeah, and and, yeah. and we, we're the ones who right. are paying the price for all of that. What right. we want is, right. at the end of the day, an alternative, uh, sustainable gov governance system that basically uh, you know, reestablishes a semblance of order, a semblance of security, a semblance of uh, a, a respect for local governance, um, which, which we see as the main tool to deconstruct tyranny and deconstruct right. corruption, deconstruct oppression, uh, which we've seen in Syria for, for decades. And I think that is the recipe for a long-term sustainability in terms of security, in terms of prosperity, mm -hmm. and in terms of also benefiting the immediate neighbors to the north and, and to right. the east as well. Okay, Murat Aslan, there's less than a minute left on the program, so I'm going to ask this very quickly. The level of cooperation 
needed in killing Baghdadi extended from Washington to Ankara and to Moscow as well. Is that a good thing? It depends. As you know, Turkey has always been in cooperation with the United States in terms of intelligence and also in some circumstances, operations. I don't know, any, you know anything about Russian cooperation, but Turks tolerated what the United States had done yesterday. So that's the issue. The second thing, we do not know what had been achieved on the ground yet, even though Trump announced right. it, because, uh, as you know, we don't have any picture of, the, of Baghdadi. Right. And another issue I think we should focus on counter-radicalization rather than the killing of Baghdadi, because we had wit witnessed Zarqawi, Masri, Baghdadi, and we will face another one in future. Right. Once you kill them, then you will face another one. Yeah, that it's what they so call the a game of whack counter radicalization, right. not killing anybody. And that's okay. why and, okay. that, and that's why you need to uh, you need solve to re causes. rely on local partners to okay. actually solve that issue. Okay. I'm over time. So gentlemen, I would have loved to have carried on, but I've got to wrap. I thank you all for joining us here on this episode of the Newsmakers.